Welcome to year two of A Mick, A Mook, and A Mike. Hosted by four-time Emmy-nominated producer, Frank Pace, and retired New York City firefighter, 9-11 first responder, and Vietnam vet, Billy O'Connor. Today's guest, former president of the National Baseball Hall of Fame, Jeff Idelson. How you doing? <laughs> That's the way to open it, Frank. Give it the energy, baby. How Give you the doing? Energy. Well, I, I, so, I, so, I, I'm pretty pissed off. What are you pissed off about now? That little fuck Kyle Rittenhouse got away scot-free. I don't know. You know what? He still might be facing all kinds of charges. Oh, I'm sure he will. But I'm pissed off about it. It, well, it makes me crazy. I mean, a fucking 17-year-old kid crossed the state lines with a gun, is dr- driven by his mother, and he's he's acquitted on all five charges. Well, that's you know horse. What? That's horse shit. Well, let's see. This- and, 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 and it's not a Republican horse shit. It's not Democratic horse shit. And I don't give a shit about what anybody says about it. Anybody's. This is not about Republican or Democrat. It's just about horse shit. Question. Kenosha, Wisconsin. Is that what this word all went down? Yeah, they have, right? a, go- they have a go- gun, gun culture and I'm going to be perfectly honest with you. I didn't follow the trial real close. You know, I really didn't. But Kenosha, Wisconsin. That's where it happened. Home of Al Molinaro. You like cheese? Yeah. Did you ever see black? Did you ever eat any black cheese? <laughs> <laughs> you got Swiss cheese. You got this kind of cheese. You got this. There's not a lot of black cheese. But let me ask you a question. The assistant DA prosecuted the case at Kenosha, Wisconsin. How come the DA didn't prosecute the case? Was there something really important going on in Kenosha, Wisconsin? That, that, that strikes me as a, wouldn't you put your bet, like this is a big case, a national read out? I mean, and then, wasn't there two mock trials that that they, these defense lawyers did? I don't know. Where did all the money come from? Where did all the money come from this guy's defense? Well, the money come from the gun lobby, of course. Did it? Of course. So they were able to do two mock defense, two mock, two mock trials. He obviously had a terrific lawyer. And they got him off. Assistant DA from Kenosha, Wisconsin? Why? I mean, uh, you know, not to sound like Derek. But I think the fix was in. Well, you know, the word privilege comes from Latin meaning private law. That's where it comes from, privilege. And uh, if it was the shoe was on the other foot, if it was uh, the guys that got killed, I don't think they would have got two mock trials. I don't think they would have got that kind of money to defend themselves. And, you know, that's why I got a big thing about capital punishment. Anybody ever see a billionaire get capital punishment? Of course not. You know, I mean, that's, that's well, except thing. except for uh, what was the the guy who was running girls to Trump, Jeffrey Epstein. He was a billionaire, but he wasn't getting the capital punishment. Well, he didn't. He didn't. He got. <laughs> <laughs> he, he didn't. He didn't. Again, I think, Do you really think he's dead. I don't think he's dead. I swear to Christ, I don't think he's dead. I oh, think wow. he's living in like in. Uh, I swear oh. to God, I think he's in the Middle East. I, you know. Who's the other guy? Oh, shit. I don't want to get off Rittenhouse. I don't want to. Oh, I, I don't want to. Fucking. Just, my, my mind is this little fucking whiny bastard crying like a baby. He was. You know what? As bad as that is, and, and you got a right to be pissed off. Like I said, I didn't follow the case. I know we had a great defense team, and I know that the prosecutors didn't do that hard a job. And the judge was in the fix also. What about Matt Getz? Matt Getz says a big smile on his face. We're going to hire him as a congressional uh, uh, assistant. You know, big joke, you know. I can't let that kind of shit go away. This weird. How many people are dead? Two? Two dead. One injured. What, and, and the police were culpable also. The police let him walk by him. They, the police were walking the other way as he was fucking shooting his gun. You know, Kenosha, Wisconsin is probably as far I, away from L.A. and New York as uh, the middle as Israel is from Dublin. I mean, it's just two different cultures, man. This is like a totally different fucking deal. I mean, it's terrible. It's terrible. But uh, that's I mean, the all, reality. All five counts. Okay. Maybe acquit him on first degree because he didn't intend to shoot them. So he didn't, it wasn't premeditated. Although my guess is it was premeditated when you cross state lines and take a gun with you to what do you think you're going to do with that gun? You're going to shoot it. But okay. If he, but you got to get him on manslaughter. Was this? It was a Black Lives Matter protest, right? Is that right? I don't remember. What was the protest? It was a Black Lives Matter yeah. protest, right? And he, 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 let me ask you a question. Suppose he was black. 
I'll pose this question to Derek. Suppose Kyle Rittenhouse was black. I, aside from the fact that his name wouldn't have been Kyle Rittenhouse, but what do you think the verdict would have been? No comment. Yeah. <laughs> Well, one thing's for sure. He wouldn't have had a defense team he had. That's for shit sure. Yeah. And uh, was it an all-white jury? I don't even know. I think a, a 10 were white and one were black. It was Kenosha, so Wisconsin. Ten, 10 and 2 then. 10 and 2. Whatever. Well, the jury, yeah. So uh, 11 angry men. What was 12 it? angry men. <laughs> was it 12 angry men? Well, how, <laughs> <laughs> what are 12 you? angry men and another angry man over here. <laughs> so we got 12 angry men and Frank. Look, I mean, I, you know, I, 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 I'm surprised, you know, that he, that all five counts were acquitted. From what I'm reading, and again, I didn't follow the trial, so I'm talking through my ass, but, uh, from what I read, the, the, the prosecutor did a fucking terrible job. The, prosec the prosecutor did a terrible job, and the judge was a, a flake. Yeah, I heard he was. Yeah, he was, got the right guy on the stand. But again, it's Kenosha, Wisconsin. I. <laughs> and you imagine a jury of his peers. Yeah. Well, Derek smiling. Yeah, I, I, Derek smiling away, but. Well, yeah. Well, you know, if I was Derek, I'd be pretty fucking pissed off, and I'm pretty pissed off as it is because I don't like the idea of. And it's not just black and white. It's money and no money. And it's not Republican and Democrat either. No, it, no it's, but not. it's not just black and white. And it's not gun rights because I, I believe in gun rights. You know, I'm a supporter of gun rights. It, I don't think the American public or the founders of the Constitution were talking about AK-47s or even could conceive of AK-47s. But, you know, a musket in every bedroom is not a, probably not a bad idea. But still. I just say the Justice Department's supposed to be weighing evenly, but I don't think it weighs evenly when it comes to not just black and white. I think it's more about money and no money. I mean, obviously, it is now. You, you have access. Now. You have access to better, uh, to better trial. Defense. It is now. It's unbelievable. Well, the, uh, someone who didn't have access to a better trial would be your friend from uh, Phoenix, the uh, QAnon showman. Shaman. <laughs> your, friend, your, friend, your, your buddy from Phoenix, the QAnon shaman. I like his outfit. I got to tell you. I who, like got, that. who got four years this week? I'd kill that outfit, though, Frank. If I wore the horns, it would, <laughs> I'd kill that outfit. Billy, when four you, years, huh? Yeah. When you told me, when you told me you knew him, I said one thing. I said, of course you did. I didn't know. I of saw course. him preaching. Of course you did. I didn't know him. I saw him preaching on a soapbox outside a comedy club one night. But I didn't know him. It was like I went up there. Oh, yeah, I did yell something at him. What the fuck did I yell at him? I yelled something stupid at him. I forget what I But I broke his balls. I know that on my way in. He was he was preaching, you know, about some nonsense. And I just yelled something at him. I forget what I yelled. But I didn't know him. Now you now now that he's gotten four years, you say you didn't know him. What if we get a picture of him holding the book up? <laughs> now he's got some notoriety. Either one of the three, either one of the three or four. <laughs> but, but by the way, that's a good segue to the book. Holidays are coming, folks. Hey, come on! Now's the time. Look, come on. Take out the communion money. You know, break it out. Break out a few bucks and buy the books. Combustible. Lamar's Gamble, If These Lips Could Talk, three different kinds of books. Confessions of a... Confessions of a Bronx Bookie. And I had a lot to confess, folks. <laughs> you still do. I had a lot to confess. You still do. But those are four books, and they're all good good reading. It's good, so I'm proud of every one of them. Frank, you're proud of your names on them? Proud of every one of them. Yes, I am. And so uh, I'm proud, proud to have our guest today, too. Yeah. Uh, Jeff Idelson was a longtime president of the Baseball Hall of Fame, and now he's co-founded with Gene First company called grassroots baseball it'll, it'll be fun to listen to jeff what he's got to say and he's 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 steeped in baseball history and baseball lore uh, how many years was he with the hall of fame 25 well, years I, I think 25 years and he's seen them all huh he's seen all of the great ones that's for sure so he'll be a, a a good interview as a matter of fact why don't we bring him on yeah 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 we'll stop and get you so you won't be so angry. Um, you're pissed. I'm, I know you're pissed I'm off. Pissed, but whatever. Right. Yeah, they'll, he'll get it. They'll, they'll get him the way they got OJ. A civil trial. What was it? Who was that last guy in Florida with the hood? The guy who shot the poor bastard with the hoodie. He turned out he put the gun up on eBay. And then about three years later, they got him for beating up yeah. his wife yeah, and everything else. They'll, they'll catch up to us. It comes back to roost, man. He'll be out dancing with the stars and then... Uh, <laughs> Hey, hey, 
<laughs> he'll be on Dancing with the Stars, and then I'll get him on a civil trial, and then it'll get put his ass in jail. So, yeah, well, you know, let's get on to a happy, happier subject. Jeff Idelson. Let's talk baseball. Let's talk baseball. baseball. Hey, it's a nice day. Let's play too. <laughs> let's play too. Ernie Banks. <laughs> uh, Ernie Banks was a great guy. I played softball with his with his sons, Joey and Jerry. They were on a, they were on our our Ringer softball team for. Uh, 25 years. Well, 25 years ago, we had a ringer softball team. Were they good? Were they both real good? Yeah, they were. They were they both. Play, yeah? They were both real good. Uh-huh. Yeah. So our guest today is Jeff Idelson, longtime president of the Baseball Hall of Fame, and now the co-founder of Grassroots Baseball with Gene Firth. Uh, welcome, Jeff Idelson. Nice to see you. Always good to see you, Frank. That's my partner, Billy O'Connor, and that's my friend, Derek Harris. Pleasure to know you, Jeff. Thanks for coming on, pal. Really appreciate it. And I'm glad you could fight my way. I'm glad you could fight your way through my emails where I said PM rather than AM. (laughs) (laughs) You said said 1130 PM. I'm going to be asleep by 10 PM. So I hope it's not 11 o'clock PM. So I said, no, 1130 1130 AM. So you've, you've, we've, He's here. He's here. That's all that counts. <laughs> we got him. We got him. So, Billy, what, you have any questions for Jeff? Oh, I got a million questions. Well, why for don't you Jeff. start off? All right. I, I, you know, man, you've met them all. You've seen them all. I mean, you go the whole route. I mean, uh, how many years with the Hall of Fame? Twenty five. Yeah, twenty five, and then I actually went back uh, this summer, so it turned into twenty six. But a long run and a lot of great, great memories, and a great way to live and raise kids and live in a wonderful town. Cooperstown, New York. I, I don't know whether you haven't been there, Billy or or Derek, but Cooperstown is a fabulous place in the summer. Uh, it's <laughs> it, it, it's bucolic. It's on a lake. Uh, it's got a golf course. Uh, it's everything. Everything right in the world is in Cooperstown, New York, in the summer. It's a a, a magical place, and Jeff was such a sp- special part of it for twenty five years. Uh, what are some of your favorite memories of Cooperstown, Jeff? Well, I think uh, of Cooperstown itself, it's uh, for those that haven't been there, it's it's like walking into a rock wall painting. It's this beautiful, beautiful village, uh, you know, 1,800 people. There's a, a traditional old school Main Street. Uh, it's central New York, so there's a lot of trees. And there the Hall of Fame sits right on uh, right in the middle of Main Street, this beautiful three-story red brick building that you don't expect to see. And, uh, and then once you go in, it's everything you hoped it would be. And I wondered where I was going. Uh, you know, moving from New York, I had been working for the Yankees. And uh, you know, uh, there were more people on, on my block that I lived on in the city than lived in Cooperstown. But once I got used to it and uh, been there a year, I realized it's where I wanted to be. The Hall of Fame is a special place, a great way to raise kids. Uh, they could walk to school. I could walk to work. So... Um, if you can if you can handle the winners, Frank, it's a really beautiful place. <laughs> All right, you you mentioned the, the, your time with the Yankees. Did you ever have any second thoughts uh, in the late '90s and the early 2000s when the Yankees were winning all of those championships about having left the Yankees to go to Cooperstown to work for the Hall of Fame? Not really. I mean, I, I, I loved my time in New York, and I was with Boston before that, Frank, but my time in New York was special and uh, developed some really, really good relationships, uh, you know, with, with a lot of the staff there, the manager, general manager, managers, but no, I was ready. I was ready for a change, and, you know, I thought that, uh, uh, I thought that Old Timers Day at Yankee Stadium was special, which it is, but uh, induction ceremony in Cooperstown is tenfold. You were with the uh, Yankees 89 to 93, is that right, Jeff? That the Steinbrenner he is, right? Did you have any confrontations with George, or is he uh, anything like the public thinks he might be, or is he? Is that the persona that we we think of George as the angry old man, or what? what was he like? He's driven. I mean, there's no other way to say it other than he was driven. And uh, as a young guy going there, I mean, I was only 24 when I started with him, and uh, yeah, I learned a lot. I mean, I learned an awful lot. I mean, I learned a lot of good things, a lot of bad things, but there was nobody who was more driven for success than than George, and. Yeah, the thing that was interesting that we, all of us who were PR guys knew that traveled with the ball club is, is that he just he just didn't sleep. He slept like three or four hours a night and didn't drink. I mean, he's one of those guys he'd you know, he'd get into a road city two in the morning and say, "What are you doing?" and say, "Call you." And you know, on the on the on the on the phone in the hotel because there were no cell phones. And yeah, well, I'm waiting for my bags. Yeah, I'll give me a call when you wake up in the morning. It's like okay. So as my colleagues and I used to, to joke, you know, when the phone would ring in the middle of the night. Um, you knew it was either a George or a death in the family. And then after a while, when that phone would ring, 
You root for the death in the family. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that answers my question. He's a tough taskmaster, I guess. That, that, that'll answer it. Well, you, you bring up George, uh, and I, I'm going to jump ahead a little bit, uh, and I'll go back to this. But do you think George is, merits a spot in the Hall of Fame? Well, I mean, you can't you can't deny what the guy did in terms of building building a dynasty there. Um, uh, you know, he had he had the seventy seven seventy eight club, which was you know they weren't dynasty, but they were competitive. The eighties were sort of marginal. He tried, but you know what what they succeeded with in the nineties under his tenure uh, is is remarkable. I mean, it's really remarkable. Uh, yeah, you balance that with um, his having some issues with baseball and, and having two suspensions, and it doesn't make it a slam dunk. But you can certainly make a case for him improving the game and and really paying paying free agents more than they ever were, uh, which helped the players. Because when he bought the club in 72, 73 from Mike Burke and CBS, the Yankees were downtrodden. I mean, the Yankees and George, to build that to, the, to 77, 78, with, with Reggie and Thurman and Catfish and all those guys, it, he, he had a, a yeoman's task ahead of him for sure. He did. I mean, you know, he was, he was you know, take it, taking an organization that had bottomed out and uh, was really wallowing. And, uh, you know, he invested he invested wisely because they won. He spent lavishly, but he wanted to win. He wanted to win for New York and brought in those guys. He had Greg Nettles. He brought in uh, Goose Gossage to close games and, uh, you know, the rest is history. So, yeah, he did a good job of building. I mean, very unconventional and uh, like a bull in a china shop, but he did get it done. I got a question for you, uh, Jeff. When you were working for the Red Sox, I mean, you, you came out and you started doing PR for the Red Sox right after college. And uh, then you went to the Yankees. Do you have a team that you're rooting for? Or is it always like, uh, this is the team that's paying my check and this is the team I'm, I'm for? And, you know, did you, did you, you know, I mean, you're a baseball guy. Did you, did you have any personal feelings for either team? Or? Oh, of course. I mean, you know, when, you, when you're growing up and, you're, you know, your parents tell you, you know, if you grow up in New York, Depending on the year, you, you you know you could have been a fan of either two or three teams. In Boston, growing up, it's like you will be a Red Sox fan kind of thing, and yeah. that was okay because my, my my parents loved baseball. I went, I started going to games when I was five with my my parents, and you know so I always I always loved the Red Sox and always had a uh, you know uh, uh, they were they were very much a part of uh, my upbringing, and I thought there was nothing other than the Red Sox. But as you're trying to get a job in baseball and work, you realize that the game is bigger than any one team, and you know, I grew up hating the Yankees, and, and as I was trying to get into the game, I was thinking, man, I'll go to any team other than the Yankees. I mean, I, they, they, they hated them going up. But, 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 but uh, you know, when the opportunity presented itself, I quickly realized that it wasn't about the team. It was about being in the sport and being a part of the fabric, and uh, that went away pretty quickly. And, uh, it, yeah, I mean, it's, it's crazy that I worked for the two of them, and when they played each other, I, root, I would root for who was, who was ever behind in the, in the standings. Uh, and then if they played each other in the playoffs, I just didn't watch. I watched them nationally. Wow, that's really something. So you mean that hot tug? Even though your your paycheck was coming from the Yankees, you couldn't you couldn't get rid of that hot tug. You really couldn't. Well, you know, it's like it's like your parents and your step parents. I mean, you have two sets, and you got to love them both. And then I went to the Hall of Fame, and all thirty of them became my children. You know, they became e- equally loved. So. Boy, that that's for sure. You know, I was talking to I I, I talked to Johnny Bench quite a lot, and. Uh, Johnny said to me one time, he said, you know, the Hall of Fame doesn't seem to be what it used to be. And I said, why is that, Johnny? He said, well, I don't know. I said, well, why don't you think of it like this? When you got in, all you had to look up to all your idols to be there. When you got in, there was Charlie Geringer was there. Joe DiMaggio was there. Sandy Koufax was there. You played against. We, we miss Sandy Koufax. But, you know. Bob Feller was there. But now you're one of the guys that people look up to. And he said, wow, I I never thought of it like that. Um, For you, being the president of the Baseball Hall of Fame, you have got to have been struck by meeting so many of your idols. Uh, Who stands out? I'm looking at your background. I'm, I'm seeing... I'm seeing Willie Mays for sure. Maybe Juan Marichal there. Uh, who stands out for you? Oh, there's so many of them, Frank. Because I mean, there was no there's no bigger fan of the game than me. I'm like anybody else. I just got lucky enough to work in the sport. And um, I mean, it was all of my baseball cards coming to life when I went to Cooperstown. And you know, the opportunity to uh, you know to meet Hank Aaron and understand where he came from and, and, and how he was wound. 
uh, you know, to George Brett and Robin Yount, who I truly idolized growing up, along with Hank Aaron, and, and, and they're a little more contemporary to me, but to get to spend time and become friends with them. That was big. Bob Feller was my, my uncle's wow. favorite player. You mentioned, you mentioned Bob Rapid and getting to meet Bob and spending a ton of time with him. Uh, all lasting memories. I mean, you know, it's, it's one thing when you're with a ball club, Frank, and you know this from Rod and whatnot, but, you know, you have a period that you're there three or four years, maybe five years if you're lucky, or 10. I had 25 years with the same guys. So I had a lot, a lot of opportunity to develop long relationships, and uh, they really became uh, more friends and, uh, than anything. And when we lost 10 guys last year, it was crushing. It was absolutely crushing. Yeah. Uh, you say you have a chance to know him. Uh, you were a guy that everybody loved. For 25 years, I never met, you never met anybody who was loved more than Jeff Idelson because no. Jeff was always there. Jeff was always making sure the guys got whatever they wanted. Uh, he was the epitome of what you would want in a baseball Hall of Fame president. He wasn't one of these guys that was talk to you nice in front of your face and then curse you out behind your back. He was always very genuine. And the players knew that. They understood that, respected it, and you know that's the, the greatest tribute I think yeah, to you. The job you did was that you were a real person. Well, that's that's awfully nice of you to say, Frank. I mean, I guess maybe that's just because I've always respected the platform and spe respected the industry, and just feel very lucky. And plus, I was brought up. I mean, my parents taught me how to behave, and yeah. you don't lose those things. Twenty-five years doing what you love. That has a lot to do with it as well, I'm sure. You, I mean, you're doing what you love, and you know the, the integrity has to shine through. You know, I mean, this is what you you love what you're doing. So, you do you do you have a, a favorite ball player or two ball players, or you, so, so so close to you, you you couldn't couldn't pick between them? But I'm going to ask you that anyway. I, you know, I don't I don't know that I have a favorite because it, it's really hard to say. I mean, I think the guys I was spending a lot of time with. Uh, Guys that I spent a, ton of, a lot of time with were Hank Aaron, uh, uh, Goose Gossage, Tom Seaver, Joe Morgan, uh, Joe Morgan, a ton. He's a vice chairman of the Hall of Fame. Right. Uh, you know, uh, Robin and Robin and George and Paul Molitor, because the three of them would always be together at the same time. And uh, but all of them, Rod. I mean, everybody. They all touched my lives, and I feel like in some way, hopefully, I I, I helped touch their lives too. How about some of the older players like Ernie Banks or? Joe DiMaggio, what kind of interactions did you have with them, Whitey Ford? Great, great Joe DiMaggio story. So DiMaggio, I'm at the Yankees, and it's Old Timers Day in, uh, I don't know, like maybe 90, 1990. And we had a young center fielder named Roberto Kelly who was, uh, had just come up and run on to play for the – we traded him to the Reds for Paul O'Neill. And uh, Roberto, Roberto is, Joe comes into Old Timers Day, and he goes up to our clubhouse guy, and he says, uh, Nick, I want to meet the Yankee center fielder, the new kid. So he goes over to, to Roberto Kelly's locker, and he's talking to Roberto, and he looks down at his locker, and he sees he's got a Don Mattingly bat, he's got a Gary Ward bat, he's got a Mike Pagliarulo bat. He says, where are your bats? And Roberto says, well, I'm a rookie. You know, I was given, you know, six at the beginning of the year, and I burned through them, so I'm using these. And uh, and so Joe just sort of nods, throws out the first pitch, goes up to uh, Mr. Steinbrenner's suite, where he always sits for old timers day, and George walks up to him and, as he always did, he puts his hands on his shoulders. Joe, so good to see you, Joe. Joe, so good to see you. And Joe just looks at him and he says, how can the Yankee center fielder not have his own bats? Three days later, Roberto Kelly had two dozen bats in his locker. Wow. 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 You know, I, uh, in the Ken Burns documentary on baseball, they talked about Joe DiMaggio and they said that he was reticent, reticent type guy. He actually, they said he led the, led the league in room service. <laughs> uh, when you met Joe, when you met Joey, uh, Joey D, did you, did you, was he, was he reticent? Was he, you know, taciturn? Was he the kind of guy that didn't speak much? Was he? Yeah. I mean, kind of like Sandy Koufax, not that he didn't speak much, but certainly, um, really private, a private guy. And, you know, in private, if he trusted you, then, you know, then he would let you in a little bit more, but, uh, everybody's wrong differently. And, you know, Joe wasn't wasn't around the Yankees that much when I was there, just on Old Timers Day, and a little bit in Cooperstown, and then he passed away, I believe, in '96, five or six. He and Mantle both, uh, so I didn't get to know him a ton, but he was always always pleasant with me. Well, on that though, was there anybody who really surprised you when you met them? I mean, these guys, of course, to me, are you know they they 
dreams, you know, like Willie Mays was, I, I lived and breathed Willie Mays for till the time I was 16 years old. I mean, you know, I used to run to the corner, get a five cent newspaper just to look at, see what Willie did for the day, you know, look at the box score and read it. Then he go three for five. Then he, when you met all these guys that you met was, any of them just really left an indelible imprint on you, completely surprised you? Probably more so Aaron than anybody. Cause I had never crossed paths with Hank. Um, you know, when he was playing, and obviously that guy, you just on a, on a, on a pedestal, you know, with, there with Jackie Robinson uh, for what he accomplished, when he accomplished it. And I had always revered Aaron. I had, you know, done book reports on him in school. And, um, you know, other guys I had known from my time with the Red Sox community, I never met Hank yet. I didn't know what he was like. And um, first time I, you know, first time I met him, he was, he was, um, you know, he was the judgment, you know, the, the, the jury was out on what, what, what he would think. I went down to do an interview with him. Uh, for the ink for the Hall of Fame to do something in the yearbook, and I sent him the piece, and he's like, "Yeah, I really I don't like this at all." And rather than say, "Well, you know, too bad," or you know, "Why?" I just said, "Okay, well, we won't run it. We'll do something else." And and once I respected him and understood him, our relationship was cemented. And after that, he would call me. I don't know. He called me four or five times uh, every year. I mean, he'd, he'd always call me around. You know, the football playoffs, and we talk about handicapping who was going to win in the NFL and. Just developed this deep relationship with him. I spent a lot of time with he and his wife in Atlanta, and uh, you know, I ended up getting him to donate his entire collection to Cooperstown. Uh, so everything he has is now in the Hall of Fame, and uh, it was a sad day for me when he passed away. Yeah, Jeff was the person that was always at World Series or All Star Games or any significant moment, anytime anything happened in baseball, and they wanted to get it donated to the Hall of Fame. Jeff was the guy they gave it to. So he was he was responsible for a lot of the collection that is in the Hall of Fame today. And if you haven't been to the Hall of Fame, I I urge anybody and everybody to go. It's really a, a magnificent place. You know, you talked about Jackie Robinson and you talked about Hank Aaron, but there's also Larry Doby, who is the most overlooked man I think in the history of sports, because. Larry Doby really accomplished everything that Hank, uh, not, uh, that Jackie Robinson accomplished two months later. Uh, and he was the second uh, black to play in the major leagues. And he was the second first man to play in the major leagues for the Cleveland Indians. Uh, and why don't you talk a little about what kind of man Larry Doby was? Oh, gosh. I mean, you, you, you struck it, Frank. I mean, nobody ever remembers who's number two. They only remember who's number one. And uh, that's just the way society is. But 12 weeks later, here's Larry Doby, you know, in Cleveland, uh, uh, breaking in and, and certainly with a lot more obstacles, I would say, than Jackie, um, not to take anything away from Jackie. Uh, but, you know, Jackie grew up in New York, which is a little more liberal than Cleveland at the time. And the spotlight was there. Uh, where, where Larry was uh, sort of breaking in in obscurity compared to Jackie Robinson, but uh, a fine gentleman, Larry Doby, who uh, you know was uh, had a great, strong constitution. He told me an interesting, a funny story, or an interesting story one time. Well, I found it interesting, and he played, he grew up in uh, he grew up in New Jersey. Uh, when I'm forgetting somewhere near Newark, I'm forgetting what town he was in. But he grew up in New Jersey and he used to play, you know, stickball as a kid in the street. And there was this one house in, in right center field where you didn't want to hit it over there because if the ball went on the porch, you didn't get it back. Kind of like, you know, in the sandlot or whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it was a guy, and this guy would sit on the porch, this older guy. And, uh, you know, one time Larry hit one over there. He broke the guy's window. He went over and apologized to the guy and paid him. Uh, and Larry finds out many, many years later that the guy sitting on the porch was a guy named Charlie Jameson who played center field for the 1920 World Series Cleveland Indians about 20 years before Larry Doby did. So maybe there was some symmetry in him going to Cleveland. Larry loved his wife, Helen. He loved his wife more than any husband I knew loved their wife. And when she passed away, I've never met a man who was more heartbroken. And he died a year later from heartbreak. Well, that, okay. So now I'm going to throw you some names because Jeff knows a lot of these icons a lot deeper than, than, you would think. So how about Ernie Banks? Why don't you give us your impressions of Ernie Banks? Ernie Banks, <laughs> Ernie Banks just had this great ability to pick your brain. He was a very, he was a guy who was interested and you never knew what was going to happen when he called. Always pleasant. He loved people. He loved people. A lot like 
a lot like Buck O'Neill. He just he loved people and he loved being around people and hearing about people. He's also inquisitive. And he calls me one day. I'm sitting in my office in Cooperstown, Frank, and he says, uh, "How are you doing? How are you doing, Jeff?" I said, "I'm doing good." He said, "I got a question for you." I said, "What's that, Ernie?" He said, uh, "Who's in charge of the seven wonders of the world?" I said, the seven <laughs> wonders of the world? Who's in charge of that? So I'm like talking to him and trying to figure out where he's going. And meanwhile, I'm doing what we all do nowadays. I'm Googling, you know, seven wonders of the world. You know, is it, is it fictitious? I mean, I know we've all heard of it, but what is it? And so I find out, I'm like, yeah, I'm like looking and I said, Lord, what, why do you, uh, why do you care? I'm like, well, what's the, what's the point? He goes, well, I heard that we're doing the list and Wrigley Field belongs on the list. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's. That's the Ernie. enthusiasm, though. You know, everything. You, first thing you think of, you hear Ernie Banks. Let's play too. I mean, that's that's the quote, right? That's Ernie Banks. Was he that exuberant about life in general? I mean, you, you told me he's super inquisitive. Very much so. I mean, he really cared about people. He really was interested in hearing other people's stories. He was one of those guys that has. He just had a very much a zest for life, as 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 vibrant as any ball player I know. He really was. He really was that way. How about Stan Musial? Stan was great. He was more. He was more about comedy. I mean, Stan was always about trying to do something funny. I mean, just really? and just like quirky, quirky stuff. We 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 had a uh, we had this touring exhibition. Frank, you remember called Baseballs America, I right, which toured toured the country for eight years. We were at the uh, LA County History Museum out your way uh, back in two thousand two, and we so we're doing. We go to Washington, and we're at the Smithsonian uh, American Museum of Natural History. We have this big dinner. We have like forty Hall of Famers there the night before, and. Stan's all excited. He's doing magic tricks at the table, you know, these funny little magic tricks. And he has this thing with like, you know, flash paper where you light it and it's a big flame and then it disappears. And unfortunately, <laughs> it didn't disappear. It lands on the tablecloth and all of a sudden the tablecloth's on fire. There's like eight Hall of Famers around and they can cheat. This is, this is great, you know. Except they're pounding out the table. That's, that's what is Stan usual. Just that. One day we had a Veterans Committee meeting. We're sitting in the Veterans Committee and we're all in this room. It's very quiet and I hear this like ringing. And I'm like, man, I'm way too young to have ringing in my ears, I think. And then I'm like walking around the room, <laughs> like looking for this ringing sound. And usual has got a suitcase with him because he's leaving like straight from the airport. And he's not going back to his room. And his, his suitcase is ringing. And he opens it up and he's got one of those old school alarm clocks in there. <laughs> Just a slightly <laughs> tablet with him. Like, you turned it off. Yeah, I was fortunate enough to be Jeff Idelson for one day uh, when we were in Atlantic City. We were doing a, a 3,000 hit show and we had to go back to the airport i think it was in philadelphia this is you and rod me and rod uh -huh. and i was sitting in the car with stan musual tony gwynn and rod carew and they were just talking hitting and it was the wow. most magnificent conversation wow. I, didn't, I didn't say i didn't say a word because there was nothing i could say i could just be all ears and i, I imagine jeff was like that too but i remember stan playing the harmonica he would he would always play "Take Me Out to the Ball Game" at the old at the Hall of Fame induction, and uh, we were in that car. And he said, "Do you got a dollar bill?" And I said, "Sure." So he made he made Karen a ring out of the dollar bill, and he signed it. And I got it upstairs. Uh, wow, to, to, that's to, to this so day. cool. He that's was he was a, a a real people person. Yeah, and uh, again, uh, he was a and he was a, such a great hitter, and he was a oh. pitcher. He came up as a pitcher from Denora, Pennsylvania, and I, I sort of, you know, I, I get in controversy with guys who always think that Ted Williams was the greatest player, the greatest hitter that ever lived, but Stan Musial was right there with Ted Williams as a hitter. Uh, he was a great, great man. I remember in that Ken Burns documentary, they said something about Musial that he hit the same against lefties and righties. He hit exactly. Yeah, same I think average. I think it was three thirty eight bat, bat average against lefties and a three thirty eight batting average against and, righties. And Holman on the road too, yep. I believe is his Holman on the road as well. Yeah, same number of hits. Yeah, why don't you why don't you, why don't you tell us about Ted Williams? Well, where do you start? I mean, that guy was unbelievable. Uh, you know, out of Hoover High School in San Diego, I did. Uh, I did the last long interview with him before he passed away in 99 uh, for the Hall of Fame yearbook. And yeah, he, he was a guy too. I brought up pitching, Frank, and I pitched in high school. He's like, you're a hell of a guy to bring up pitching. No one ever wants to talk about my pitching, that kind of thing. Wow. But, uh, you know, this is this, this guy who did the, you know, two tours, uh, World War II in Korea. So he lost a lot of time, uh, you know, a lot of service time. 
but uh, just a you know a hell of a hitter, hell of a pure hitter. Fenway Park was made for him, and uh, he was the guy, Frank, that was you know you talk about Bench becoming that guy in Cooperstown, and Ted was that guy, very loud, boisterous uh, voice. And when he would come into Cooperstown and sit on that back porch, everybody circled around him to hear his stories. He loved telling stories. Love fishing. He and Bobby Dore had a great relationship, you know, about salmon fishing. And, uh, you know, every time he came to Cooperstown, he'd get up at six in the morning, head over to that sea, go wake and drop a line in the water. Yeah. You, you mentioned that the back porch at, uh, uh, at Cooperstown, the, the Atsego Hotel is where all the players stay. And the Hall of Fame controls very tightly who gets in the Hall of Fame, uh, who gets on the premises and who does not. And I've been fortunate enough the three times I've been to Cooperstown to stay at the Otsego. And uh, the history and the guys, and you have access to everybody and everything. And it's such a wonderful weekend. Um, and I got, you know, I got, you, you get a chance to meet your friends. and But they all tell stories. I mean, that's what the Hall of Fame is about. It's the most exclusive club in the world. And it, it's the guys, Rod says always that the commissioner's dinner on Sunday night after the induction is that there's nothing but Hall of Famers there. The only people invited, Hall of Famers and the commissioner. And the stories that they tell, uh, maybe, maybe you, are you, are you allowed in that event, Jeff? Are you allowed in the commissioner's dinner? On oh, yeah. On not, I went to 25. Well, no, I went to 12 of them. Well, yeah. why, don't, why don't you tell us about the commissioner's dinner rather than me telling secondhand what goes on with the dinner because the, the, the guys, and I'll, I'll just preface this, but the guys all break up. The home run hitters are together. The pitchers are together. Oh, is that right? They, well, they, they, they just sort <laughs> they of just they just gravitate. Sort of they gravitate. gravitate you know, the, the singles hitters are together. Wow. The guys that won batting titles together. But why don't you tell us a little about the commissioner's dinner, Jeff? Yeah, well, you just explained it, Frank. It's uh, basically, it's, it's, it's after the Sunday induction when the guys, uh, you know, formally get their plaque and it goes up on the wall after dinner. Or after that ceremony, we do the big group picture of all the Hall of Famers on the on the back lawn. Uh, the Hall of Famer uh, wives and significant others they have a picture as well, and then each has its own dinner. The Hall of Famers have one dinner, and the wives have another dinner, and um, it's uh, it's it's basically limited to them and uh, uh, Commissioner and myself, and now Josh Rowich who's taken over. But yeah, it's a type of thing where I just go in and I wait and see where there's an empty seat. I wait and see where there's an empty seat. You know, it's like I, they have their little niches, as you said, Frank. You get the you know the home run hitters, and you get the infielder hitters. And Morgan used to wonder why he couldn't be at the home run hitters table since he had the all time record until Sandberg came along and Jeff Kett came along for most home runs by a second baseman. And it's like, well, you're not really a punch and Judy guy, but you are a middle infielder. Go to the middle infielders table, that kind of thing. Pitchers have their table, the wine drinkers have their table. I generally sat with whoever was left over, which is not bad. Not bad at all. Not bad. So I, 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 my guess is I'm told that Seaver was at the pitcher's dinner and we always bring a, a couple of bottles of, of Tom Seaver vintage wine to the table. Is that true? And yeah, Tom loved pouring his wine. And, uh, you know, he had that. He still has that great vineyard up in Calistoga where he does a Cabernet. He does GTS Vineyards, George Thomas Seaver, and the Nancy's Fancy, which is named after his wife, Nancy. But uh, he always brought wine to the table, and, and all these guys became wine, wine guys. I mean, I remember, you know, when Yount when and Brett went in, it was great because they were beer drinkers, and my, my dinner tabs were a lot cheaper than after they became wine drinkers. <laughs> <laughs> so who, what are some of the tables that you were found a seat at? I generally was at table with 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 Rob and Bud before that, and then uh, you know guys like Doug Harvey or Whitey Ford, and you know guys who sort of were uh, Al Kaline. That you know just the, the, the table selection became a younger man's game, and I ended up more with the veteran guys. Well, Kaline was a special guy. Also, uh, he was a great golfer. He was a great. He spent 19 years with the Detroit Tigers. I think 19 years. He won an American League batting title at 22. Yeah, if I'm wrong with these dates, correct me. But uh, they always would play. Uh, what a preamble to the Hall of Fame was a, a golf tournament that was held held right there on the premises. And one day I got to play in a fivesome with Rod Carew, Steve Carlton, Johnny Bench, and Al Kaline. Wow, that was wow. That, that was a great day. And we got to one hole, and Johnny said. Wait until we get out of the fairway. I'll show you guys something. And he 
he had a 350 drive, 50, 50 yard drive on a hole, and they have a plaque there to, to mark the spot where it landed. Wow, they were wow. great, great guys and great, great memories. Uh, who else? Uh, uh, what about Whitey Ford? What can you tell us about Whitey Ford? Well, Whitey had a really close relationship with, and uh, funny story with Whitey. I mean, uh, you know, his <laughs> a lot of funny stories with Whitey. But he, uh, you know, he he, uh, he, yeah, he he was tight with with, with Mantle and Billy Martin and Cleve Four, and you know, he went with that group. And one day, Frank, we're sitting around and uh, we're in Cooperstown. We're putting together a a list of guys who may have been overlooked for an old timers ballot. You know, guys from long ago. And I'm in a room with you know. Whitey, uh, Monty Irvin, Feller, the usual, that generation of players, uh, Robin Roberts. And uh, I'm sitting next to Whitey, who's got, you know, his two fingers of vodka at the table. And we're talking, we're sitting there and going through this list and, and, and uh, Spud Chandler comes up. And I don't know if you know who Spud Chandler is, but he had committed to uh, No, that was Happy Chandler. Oh, Happy Chandler. Spud Chandler was a pitcher for the Yankees? Chandler was a pitcher for the Yankees right. who had a short but meteoric career. Uh, he pitched in the 30s, and he retired with like like a 718 winning percentage. And Whitey Ford, I mean, Whitey had a 695 winning percentage. So it wasn't oh. that different. So I turned to Whitey, and I, and I whispered to him, and I said, Whitey, you know, how is it that Spud Chandler, how is it that you're in the Hall of Fame? You're sitting here in the Hall of Fame, Whitey, and this poor guy, Spud Chandler, who's Obviously, a markedly better pitcher than you ever were. He's on the outside, <laughs> on the outside looking in, and he doesn't miss a beat. He takes a sip of his vodka. He looks at me, and says, "Jeff, he didn't have to go out drinking with Billy and Mickey every night." Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's quite a handicap right there. How about uh, Mickey Mantle? What do you got a Mickey story? Not really, because Mickey died in '95. Um, he wasn't really coming to Old Timers Day that much at that point, because he was pretty sick with the, you know, the liver disease that he had. And um, you know, I just, in terms of like revered and star power, uh, and what he stood for, uh, obviously was huge. Even you know, even with DiMaggio around and, and all those great Yankees, Mantle was still beloved by all. And uh, uh, you know, through my grassroots baseball work uh, with Gene. Uh, the next project we're doing, we're just finishing a book on, on grassroots baseball along the Mother Road, along Route 66. And Mantle grew up in Commerce, Oklahoma, as we know, which is right on Route 66. And uh, getting to spend about a week in Commerce and really understand the environment he came from. We have a we have a picture of his childhood home with the, with the current baseball team in front of it as a salute. Really gave me an understanding of, of just how... Uh, how poor of a background he came from. It was, it was, it was coal and zinc mining where he lived and uh, uh, gave, gives you an idea of what he overcame and how he persevered to be the player that he was. Yeah, we're going to get to grassroots baseball in a little bit because we're going to play a, a one-minute video on grassroots baseball, which Jeff's doing now. But uh, we're, we're, we're uh, pursuing the Hall of Fame uh, because we've got a, a bunch of areas to, to go to on the Hall of Fame. How about the first... 100% vote getter in the Hall of Fame history, Mario, Mariano Rivera. We surprised that the Hall of Fame has now gotten to the writers will vote somebody in 100%, or they, or the fact is that they probably should have been voting, somebody should have been getting 100% of the vote years ago. But what's your take on that? Well, you, you know that, Frank. I mean, cause my impression is I was surprised because it's hard to get, you know, Three, four or five hundred people to agree on something, let alone four or five. I mean, the four of us could sit around and argue whether we're really doing a Zoomcast or not and, and, and make arguments. And here we have four or five hundred people uh, voting on a guy who threw once one pitch. I mean, he threw a cutter and was successful for his entire career with it. And it really just, it, it honestly just speaks to how way far ahead of the field he was among closers the fact, and relief pitchers, the fact that they would, the, the writers would vote him in at 100%. It makes no sense. I mean, really, if you think about it, that Mickey Mantle or not Mickey, or Mickey Mantle or Hank Aaron or Joe DiMaggio or, you know, Cy Young with 511 wins. Or, or, Will, first, or Willie Mays or, or Hank Aaron or, yeah, I mean, all of them. Really more t sign of the times, I guess, and, and maybe maybe the fear now that you don't want to be the one who didn't vote. Maybe there's some of that. How can you give me a guy like Cy Young, five hundred eleven wins, and not get hundred and not get a hundred percent of the votes? I, I don't understand that. That's mind boggling to me. Who could vote against the guy who's got five hundred eleven wins? Well, it's since, insane. Since Billy's here, why don't you, uh, I know you've got some stories about Willie Mays, who is Willie's oh, my man. I Willie's, mean, I, I got to tell man. you, can growing you, up, can, I, can you share a story about Willie or a story or two? It's a bad story. Don't tell it. <laughs> 
Don't just oh, shout about like the illusions. Jeff, Jeff is the kind of guy that doesn't know any bad stories. He only knows good stories. I take him to the grave. No, uh, so no, just to, to finish up on Cy Young, it's like Warren Spahn going in and arguing with Bob Quinn after he won 25 games in Boston and saying, "Why didn't I get a raise?" And Quinn said, "You should have won 30." Well, maybe Cy Young should have won 600. I don't know. I'll, I'll tell you. Uh, I'll tell you a, 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 a quick, a quick Warren Spahn story. Uh, Warren Spahn was 45 years old or 46 years old, and he was pitching an old timers game. And Tom Greve came up and got a double off the wall. And after the game, he was in the dugout bragging about doubling off the wall against Warren Spahn. And Spahn was hurt it, and he was really pissed. He said, let me ask you a question, young fella. He says, how old are you? He says, 34 years old. He said, when I was 34 years old, I had 200 more games to win in the major leagues. I wouldn't be talking about bragging about getting a hit in an old timers game against a 47 year old man. That was hard. Time. So he was still like competitive. He was pissed about the double. Yep. Yeah. So, so uh, please, give me some other yeah. stories. Come on. Let me have it. I'm, I'm dying. He's, he, was, he was, I lived and, lived and breathed and everything he ever did. Well, Wonderful guy, and actually, I don't live far from him now. I live about forty minutes away. And uh, I, I, before COVID, I was going down to see him quite a bit, just to, to hang out and talk baseball. But uh, you know, he's a guy who's a fixture at Giant Stadium uh, at the Giant Stadium eighteen, well, at Oracle Park, I guess it's called now. And um, his, he just loves sitting. His favorite thing to do is sit into uh, uh, Mike Murphy, who was the clubhouse guy forever, San Francisco, who retired about five years ago. He, he'd come over from the Seals. Uh, to the Giants when the Giants got the team in San Francisco and he would just sit in Murph's office and he lo- he would always sit at one of these square card tables like you had when, the, when you were a kid, you know, and you know your parents would play cards or whatever, but he'd always sit at a card table because he can't see well, so he wanted some sort of boundaries around him a little bit, but he would have anybody who came into the room sign his card table with a Sharpie. And I said that to, to Murph, I said, you know, how do you, you know, how do you, you know, prepare for this because Willie's so here all the time. He took me in the back room. He had like 25 card tables back there because Willie really wanted a new one every single day. And he had all the hundreds and hundreds of tables with all these signatures on it from current giants, Hall of Famers, whoever came in the room. But he's a guy who just loved being at the, he loves being at the ballpark. He lives in Breeze baseball. There's nothing else really uh, uh, to his, that's more important in his life than baseball. And I guess the funniest story I remember with Willie is, is talking to him about playing in the Negro Leagues really briefly when he was very young. And uh, he played center field, and his, he got to play with his dad, who played left field. And he, he loved his dad. His dad brought him his equipment, his first equipment and stuff. And, you know, there would be balls into to, to left center field, further to left field. And Willie, you know, his dad wouldn't move. And Willie's over there, and he's like, you know, Dad, you know. Willie really had that high pitch. High pitch <laughs> high pitch. You know, Dad, you're going to play left field. you got to catch the ball. He's like, you're the, you're the young one, Willie. You catch them all. You know, and he would just leave it to Willie. And uh, just that was just a fond memory he had with his dad. And, uh like the Griffies, at least they got to play together for a little bit. I had no idea that it's been that he played ball with his dad. That's a terrific story. Uh, you had you had mentioned that uh, your first, your last inductee into the Hall of Fame under your tenure was Derek Jeter, and your yeah. first were uh, Scooter DeRocher and uh, and Lefty. That's Carlton, right? So, I mean, that's some array of, of ball players right there. And, and in between that, twenty five years. Reminds me of the gravestone, you know, from 1948 to 1975 and the dash. That's some bloody dash that you got there, 25 years. That's that's a hell of a dash. Anybody yeah. just stands out besides Aaron is just indelible in your mind, the personality, a dominating personality, or just not so much for their baseball accomplishments, but let me let me let me rephrase that. Whose speech surprised you the most with its eloquence? Oh. Okay, that's good. Well, speeches, yeah, that's another thing. People, they have no idea. I mean, to, to stand up on that stage, I mean, to give a speech is one thing, but to stand on a stage where you got three seminal audiences in front of you, okay, you've got your, your, you look in the front row and you've got your family, the people that put up with you all these years. You turn around, you got 50 Hall of Famers, and you're wondering, what the hell am I doing on this stage with them? And then you look out and you see 40,000 people, and the enormity starts to hit you. It really does for these guys. So, um, you know, I, I really stressed with them how important preparation is. And uh, uh, to no great surprise, Ricky Henderson took it to the next level. He went, to, he went back to school. He took a speech class uh, and, then, and then really worked at it. And I worked with Ricky at the Yankees, so I, 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 knew, I was worried about him being able to be understood because he speaks so quickly. And 
he came out, he prepped, he practiced, and his speech coach, I've never seen this, suggested that he put his, you know, he had a three ring binder for the speech in plastic sleeves because you're outside and it can be rainy or windy and you don't want your speech blown away. Uh, so he put his speech in, in reverse order. So he started at the back of the book. So he opens up, he gets to the podium and he flips to the back and I'm like, uh oh. And then he reads the last paragraph and he actually tempoed through that speech so well. And it was so intelligible and he was so funny. The jokes he made were actually making, you know, jokes with Reggie and uh, just having a lot of fun with it. He surprised me the most. I give George Brett and Phil Necro props for uh, for great speeches that revolve around revolve around family. Uh, with Nuxi talking about his dad coming back from working in the coal mines and never being too tired to play catch with him and Joe and his sister. Uh, George Brett being wondering that and thinking that he was the worst of the Brett brothers and and here he is on stage and his brothers weren't. Uh, that's when Ken was really sick, uh, really really sick at that point, which was sad. And then I look at Ryan, Ryan Sandberg talking about integrity and then the integrity of the game. And uh, that was a powerful speech as well. You know, when, when Rod was doing his speech, we spent a lot of time preparing his speech. And uh, the day before, we spent the entire day in the hotel room just running the speech and running the speech and running the speech and running the speech. So as he was walking up, and it, Rod's was a relatively short speech. It was about a 10-minute speech. But it was, you know, in my mind, it was a very eloquent speech as well. And as we were walking up, Ernie Banks yelled out, "Keep it short, Rook." Of course, he was on the, the, the dais, and all the Hall of Famers, what they want is they want those speeches to be short. So keep it short, Rook. Put a, a capper on it. But then, when Rod was doing his very eloquent speech, there was a rumbling as as he was talking about mentioning and thanking Billy Martin. There was a rumbling from thunder from the crowd, and Rod ad libbed and he said, "There's Billy now," and he got the <laughs> biggest laugh, and it was the greatest moment. Spontaneous, and spontaneous, yes. and it was. It was. I'm glad you said that about Ricky game. Henderson, though, because I, uh, I, I haven't met anybody, but I ran into Ricky Henderson at a, at a basketball All Star game in Phoenix. My son was crazy for basketball, and I always heard that Ricky Henderson was like, you know, like the temperamental type of guy, the sweetest guy in the world. I just said to him, Ricky, can you? Can you give an autograph to a New York kid? He said, New York kid, I'm buying him ice cream. That's when he's with the Yankees. He, bought, he must have bought 20 kids ice cream. One of the sweetest guys in the world. I couldn't believe how affable he was. Yeah, we, we had great, another great story about that's along that line is uh, we had a kid out of Cooper. And Cooper sounds tiny. I mean, and, and, and they got a short, short baseball season because, you know, winter goes until, you know, almost May. They play like 15 games. We had a kid actually get drafted uh, as a catcher. Went, he, a kid named Phil Pohl, P-O-H-L. He went to Clemson. He was a two-time academic All-American. Then he got drafted by the A's. And he was up, you know, when he got drafted by the A's, it was a big deal for Cooperstown. And this, this kid's just solid. And I, I said to Rick, I talked to Ricky in spring training. He spends a lot of time in minor league camp. I'm like, look, we got this kid from Cooperstown. It'd be great if you could say hello to him. And every every spring, after the first time, he you know, I get a call from Phil saying, Ricky came over, gave me words of encouragement. You remembered. And that's how he is. That's how he's wound. So, Jeff, I'm going to put you on the spot now. Uh, what's your position regarding Bonds and Clemens being in the Hall of Fame? Tough one. I mean, it's really, really tough. I guess if, uh, you know, the, 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 the cloud of steroids over the two of them is, is unfortunate. Uh, both of those guys are, you know, arguably among the game, game's all-time greats and without a doubt would have a plaque in Cooperstown if there weren't the conversation of steroids. And uh, I think that, that it's going to be tough. I don't see the voters – Voting him in this, this, they're both on the ballot for the last time this year, and I, I'd be, I'd be stunned if either of them made it up, made up that many votes. But uh, you know, as you know, Frank, that building in Cooperstown is a Hall of Fame and a museum, and both of those guys complete stories as players as part of the museum experience because of how indelible their their uh, contributions were as players. Um, the Hall of Fame is a celebratory part, and that's where the gold, you know, the, the seal of approval comes. And I just know that the, the voters. Uh, by and large, a majority of them, as the public do, uh, don't have an interest in seeing you know guys that uh, potentially have that 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 cloud of steroid uh, voted in. Uh, you could argue some guys that are already in that use steroids. It's hard to know. And I think from the American standpoint, American public standpoint, American public doesn't care about steroids. It doesn't affect their lives. But what they don't like are people who cheat to break records. And when you look at Bonds and Clemens uh, juxtaposed against other players who might use steroids. They stand out because they were record breakers. Um, As do McGuire and Palmero. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Exactly. 
so I'll, I'll, I'll ask another question about with gambling taking such a predominant role in baseball today and baseball embracing gambling. What do you think about Shoeless Joe Jackson and Pete Rose taking their rightful place in the Hall of Fame? Well, I know how you feel because you just said <laughs> rightful. <laughs> From my standpoint, uh, I, I have a I have a serious problem with Rose being in the Hall of Fame, and, and I I mean, look, I, I love Pete Rose as a player, no no doubt about it. But the rules were very explicit, and very clear about gambling, and he chose to break them. And he chose to, and, and he didn't hide it. Or, well, he did hide it, and then he didn't hide it. So, you know, this is a guy who gambled as a manager. He had inside information to, to be able to make determinations. And then there's the argument, well, he only bet on his team to win. Well, of course, would you bet on your team to lose? By not betting, you're saying your team's going to lose. And, but, you know, I'm all about forgiveness. And he had plenty of opportunity to forgive. And instead of forgiving, he chose to capitalize on the, on the gambling. And I don't fault him. It's like any kind of addiction. I know addicts. I know people who are drug addicts, alcohol addicts, gambling addicts. It's an addiction. By the way, Billy's, from. Billy's all of those. <laughs> Billy, was a, Billy was a gambling addict. He was a drug addict. And he was a, uh, a, a drinking addict. And he's, he, he's purged himself of all of those. An avalanche of vices. Just an avalanche. And the only thing I can't yeah. resist is temptation. That's the only <laughs> thing I can't resist. <laughs> So I mean I have a, I mean I, I love Pete Rose but to, but but to, but to 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 take the rules and put them in you know put it in your face Fair. why should he get a black and Cooper's time? Yes, but he was not he was never going to be voted in as a manager he was going to be voted in as a player and he, when he was gambling I, I, again this is just me I, I I you you have a hall museum where the all time hit leader isn't in the all time Cy Young leader isn't in the all time Home run leader isn't in. Uh, it's it's, it's, a, a little, it's casts a pall over the Hall of Fame a slight bit. It doesn't it doesn't change anything other guys did. The, the accomplishments that other guys did just sort of leaves me with a little bit of a. I don't want to say a bad taste in my mouth because I don't think McGuire McGuire deserves to be in or. Well, yeah, but you can't make that judgment, I right? I mean, that's, can't, you you know, can't make the judgment. Can't make and, that and, judgment. and better people than me are making the judgment, and I, I guess I agree with the p- people who are making the judgment. So, yeah, it's it's, just, it's, just, it's, fair. it's makes it uncomfortable. I mean, do you think I wanted to sit there for 25 years and defend, you know, the all time home run leader, hits leader, and Cy Young leader not being in, or however long it was? That's not easy. I mean, it would be great if they were, if, 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 if it were a different world, but the Hall of Fame put. You know, the Hall of Fame put, put stipulations on being a Hall of Famer. Uh, just one more question. Uh, how about the all-time umpiring leader? Do you think he's going to get in? Uh, Cowboy Joe West, when he's up for induction, whether it's <laughs> 2022. I mean, Bill Clem is in. Doug Harvey is in. Uh, I, I, we, we both, we're both good friends with Joe. So uh, what, are, what, are, what are his odds? I think that uh, there's a few umpires, I think, who certainly deserve consideration. Joe, Bruce Fremming, uh, you know, um, there's, there's a couple of others. But uh, umpires, it's hard, to, it's hard for them to get elected because what they do is so subjective. And, you know, you, other than longevity, it's, it's hard to discern, you know, uh, the greats from the almost greats. And so they deserve a place. There's a reason that umpires are a category. Uh, and I do hope that one day Joe West and Bruce Fremming make it. Okay, you said the greats from the almost greats. To me, it seems like the Hall is lowering their expectations a little bit to allowing the almost greats to take a place next to the greats. Uh, Reggie Jackson always used to say, if you're not a first ballot Hall of Famer, you're not a true Hall of Famer. Uh, I don't agree with that. But, you know, there are a couple of people that got no votes or not uh, got 10% of the votes the first time around and they get in their last time around the, the 15th time around or the 10th time around, they didn't hit any home runs or they didn't win any games in the intervening 10 years. Uh, do you feel okay with that? Those players being in the hall of fame? I do. I mean, if it was just first ballot guys, there'd be about a hundred people in the hall of fame and most of them would be dead. So it'd be a pretty, pretty empty place. Actually, uh, actually, when Rod got in, he was only the 22nd Hall of Favor to get it on the first ballot. And now there's maybe 50 of them. So, Right, or 50, right? So it'd be a pretty yeah. lonely place. Yep. 
you know, and it's subjective. I, I, I think that, you know, I think that uh, it depends when guys came on the ballot and, 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 you know, getting, again, you need 75% to get in. And it's still only about one and a half percent of those who played the game have a plaque. So it is exclusive, uh, but it's not as exclusive. But I do, I do believe the writers have done a, a good job on the writer's ballot. Maybe there's some guys on the veterans committee you could scratch your head about um, down the line. But it, it, by and large, I think you can make a case for everybody. I, w- I would say you can make, I would, say that, I would say that there are more people on the outside looking in you can make a case for than guys on the inside that don't belong. Yeah, and I think that the the Veterans Committee and the Old Timers Committee are, are, are a good barometer of players that should get in because, uh, you know, you can make an argument for Garvey, you can make an argument for Tony Oliva, you can make a great argument for Lefty O'Doul uh, back in the 30s, all guys that, you know, merit consideration. So it'll be interesting to see this year uh, who the Veterans Committee puts in and who the uh, – the old time committee puts in as well. So it's, it's interesting. So let's segue to grassroots baseball. Derek, can you get that uh, clip ready? Because I know you're doing great work with Gene Firth. Um, and we're going to, as soon as we get the, uh, uh, here, here we go. We're going to play a YouTube clip now. It's going to it just seemed like the right place to start. Route 66, it doesn't get any more Americana than that. That thing was jammed with baseballs. Hi. Hi. My name is Jean, Jean Fruth, and I'm here to talk to you about a new project that me and my partner, Jeff Idelson, started called Grassroots Baseball. And we're traveling along Route 66 with my partner in an RV, and we are spreading the word of baseball and baseball being fun. Not baseball in the major leagues, but baseball where you play baseball. Yes. So why don't you tell us a little about grassroots baseball, Jeff? Yeah, so so Jean, uh, Jean is a preeminent photographer uh, who, whose work is just amazing. She's shooting the major league game for the last 20 years, and but her, her passion lies with kids. She loves uh, shooting kids all over the globe. And she put together the, a book, Grassroots Baseball, Where Legends Begin, uh, which was, which was uh, a her work all put together in this gorgeous book, which came out in 2019. We have 13 Hall of Famers who participated. Rod wrote a, a blurb for the back cover as a, as a photographer, uh, and 16 players overall who lent their voices to what it was like to grow up in these cool communities around the globe, uh, and what it was like to be a baseball player as a young kid. Uh, you know, guys like Nolan Ryan, uh, Pedro Rodriguez, Vladdy Guerrero, Whitey Ford, uh, Wade Boggs, Ricky Henderson. Each year is in it, Fernando's in it, and um, they all wanted to participate in this book and, and just to, as a give back to their communities. And the book was did so well, and we had so much success putting it together that we decided we wanted to turn it into a not-for-profit. So as I was leaving the Hall of Fame, we developed this program called Grassroots Baseball, which is promoting the amateur game and giving back in underprivileged communities to help try to grow the game. Uh, and we started with 10 clinics before COVID in 2019 with guys like Jim Tomey and George Brett and uh, uh, Jim Tomey and George Brett, Ozzie Smith, uh, Johnny Bench, uh, Trevor Hoffman, and did clinics all along Route 66 with kids uh, trying to get them interested in the game. And Rowling stepped up and helped us uh, uh, get uh, baseball gloves and balls at a discounted price. The Cal Rook and San- Senior Foundation worked with us. A couple of ball clubs, the Diamondbacks and Padres supported us. Sony, Marriott. They all jumped on board and uh, big league too. Big league too. Rob yeah, Nelson was, have, a, was a big league was a great guest for us. Ellie's great, and so this program has taken off and done really well. And uh, a second book, Grassroots Baseball Route sixty six, will come out in the spring, and we look forward to taking it uh, to outside of the country, perhaps as as things start to get better here. I noticed that uh, Goose Gossage was uh, one of the spokesmen uh, for big uh, for for big league too for the book. Uh, did you? First meet uh, Goose. Goose was part of your first induction class. Is that true? Uh, Goose, I, Goose I date back to because he was at the Yankees when I was there on a second tour you know, with us before he went to the Mariners in Japan. Uh, but then, yeah, he as president, he was my first, uh, the first guy I inducted, which was great because I worked with him. 
Yeah. And that, that gave you a certain, certain kinship to goose that brought him into grassroots baseball. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the great thing is he came back to the Yankees and the first road trip we had was in Oakland and, uh, we were staying downtown Oakland, which is, you know, was pretty rough and tumble back then. And I'm, I'm like, a, I don't care. I mean, so I'm taking the bark to the ballpark. I'll just, we're not taking the bus and I'm in the lobby and goose, you know, I introduced myself. He had just come over. He said, where are you going? I said, I'm taking the subway to the ballpark. He's like, can I go with you? It's like, yeah. So we developed a friendship right away. And he's the only ball player I've worked with that took a subway with me to the ballpark. Uh, and what's the, uh, is it grassrootsbaseball.org? Grassrootsbaseball.org. Uh, we're on Instagram at Grassroots Baseball, Twitter and Facebook. And uh, lots of great photos and, and, and great stories really about uh, helping kids. And as we all know, Frank, you know this well, baseball and sports in general uh, are great for kids. It, it teaches them to be on time. It teaches them about healthy living, about respecting teammates. So we're not only about building, uh, giving kids opportunity, but helping them understand how it can help them sur- survive and succeed in life. And do you think you'll continue doing this for the next 10 years? Oh, I love it. Uh, Gene and I have a phenomenal program. We're looking you know, to grow it and expand upon it. And uh, we want to make a difference. We want, we want kids to have an opportunity, and uh, we think we can, we can start to peck away at that. I think, uh, I think baseball, like you talk about reviving baseball in the inner cities and everything, teaching kids more about baseball, it is a metaphor for life. You teach how to win and lose, how to compete, how to, how to beat. I think growing up in the streets, we learned that, even playing stickball, you know, uh, how to win, how to lose, you know, how to compete. And uh, I think it's great. It's wonderful. Well, it is. And, you know, it's, it, it, the, failure in, the failure rate in baseball is high. You know, if you know you're failing seven or eight times out of ten when you're hitting, you learn to accept failure. And base and life is full of failure. It's it's focus. Life is about overcoming adversity in a lot of ways. So baseball is a great way to get that started as a young age. It's like at a young age, you got your start pitching peanuts, pretty much, didn't you? In, in Boston, that was your start, wasn't it? It was fun, right? It was nothing better. You know, the, the great thing about it was that we were done in the sixth inning, which means means after cashing out, I got to watch the last two frames. You should, Very be, cool. you should be a best story on DreamWorks or something. I mean, talk about living a dream. Going from there to the Hall of Fame for pitching peanuts. That's a hell of a story. Wow. Wow. Crazy. Absolutely crazy. But I've always done what I loved. And as we said, you know, you get, I, as I tell interns, I've never once woken up and said, oh, no, I have to go to work today. Yeah. Never. Well, we, who do we talk to that recently? Oh, with Shelly Jensen. Shelly Jensen. We, we talked to uh, the director, Shelly Jensen. Doing what you love. He, doing what you love. And that's what that's what you have to set out to do. Uh, you know, we talked about we talked to Andy Strasberg, who's a previous guest when he was with the, Andy's an old friend from White Plains. Um, he, he always wanted to be work for a baseball club from the time he was 10 or 11 years old, a young kid. When did you decide you wanted to be in baseball, make a career out of it? Well, early, I mean, I knew I wanted to be involved in it. I mean, I, I, first you think you can play and then you realize you can't play like most people. But, you know, I grew up reading the Boston Globe, delivering the Boston Globe and all the, you know, I, I like, and I, I adored sports writers. They, they brought me the game. I listened to the games on the radio. So I wanted to, if I wasn't going to play, I wanted to be, I thought maybe I want to be a broadcaster. Or I want to be a writer. And then uh, I got a break to intern in PR uh, right out of college and uh, realized that servicing the media was really, really great. And I love that too. And helping those uh, which, men and women. Which intern? The Red Sox. Oh, so okay. Was, yeah, so, I got out of school and then they hired me shortly so, thereafter. So we, when you interned with the Red Sox, you obviously knew our friend, a friend of a Mick, a Mook, and a Mike, Leslie Visser. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Met Leslie Visser. And, and of course, Tim Mead, who's in Southern California, who's the Angels PR guy. Yep. Uh, and then, of course, you know, Leslie Visser, because she's married to Dick Stockton, too. I want to ask you if you have any Leslie Visser stories. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> I don't. So, uh, Billy, you have any final questions? Just a real quick one. I, I uh, you know, when I was looking at the, at the, at the research here, the, especially with grassroots baseball, I'll talk about the Japanese baseball, the fixation in Japan with baseball, and then Puerto Rican baseball. And then I made a note about Curacao. Uh, Little League, Curacao Baseball? What, what is that all about? I never even thought about the ABC Islands and, and thinking about baseball. What it- Curacao, is, uh, Curacao is the untapped mine. That's like your Bitcoin. That's where you want to go next or whatever people invest in. But you look at Curacao as a Bitcoin, ten- Curacao- Billy. <laughs> I don't know anything about Bitcoin. Throw it I don't know. <laughs> so, so Curacao, really, it blew me away. Yeah, but when you when you look at that, that's a tiny island with just 150,000 residents. It's tiny. They've had 17 players go to the major leagues. 
And, you know, guys like Hensley Mullins was the first, of course, who I was with. Uh, I was with the Yankees. He came up, and then you got Andrew Jones and Ozzie Albies and, wow. uh, yeah, you know, go, uh, Ken, Kenley Jansen, Simmons, Andrewton Simmons. I mean, they, a treasure trove of baseball comes off that island. It's impressive. Yeah, well, that's like the old saying, uh, when they're all hitters. All hitters are pitchers. And uh, that somebody asked somebody, why are, they, why are you guys hitters? And th- they said, because you can't walk off the island. So we're not we're not looking for walks. We gotta we gotta we gotta hit, be hitters or pitchers. I actually put three question marks after Curacao baseball. I said, you know, Japan, Puerto Rico. I get a Curacao, like you know, Bing Bing, like blew me away because I've been there. I've been to Curacao, and uh, like you said, it's a tiny little island. It's so, so Jeff. Now now we're going to ask you questions, and we're we're going to change them just a little bit. So, what baseball book are you reading currently? I just got done reading a book about the uh, 1918 World Series and the and the Spanish flu. Whoa, which was, was pretty interesting. Uh, it's 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 a, you know that was my pandemic reading. <laughs> <laughs> pandemic. Uh, I don't know. I don't know what's next. Okay. Okay. Uh, what what was oh the 1919 baseball scare was the Black Sox scandal. I see. I've seen pictures from 1918. People in masks uh, at the ballpark, it was incredible to, to me. It was. I mean, it's, you know, baseball persevered. The Red Sox ended up winning the World Series, and then all those guys went off to help help our country, you know, uh, with what was going on in World War One, and then all the, you know, you learn, like, uh, you, know, with co- you know, with COVID now, it's like when you people are in groups, that's when they get sick, and that's what it all happened in the military. The military just got decimated because they were all together and breathing the same air. Wow. What baseball movie would you like to see one more time before you died? Before I died. No, hopefully I'm not going to die for a while. But I did watch 42 again last night. I can't get enough of that. I just think it's really well done, the film that Thomas Tall did. I love A League of Their Own. Um, maybe A League of Their Own. Maybe before I go, I'll be, I'll be, I'll be closing the door to the coffin. I'll be watching that. <laughs> What's your favorite baseball song? Uh, favorite baseball song. Well, I could I could say my favorite baseball song is the national anthem, like Rod, because that means I'm going to get two hits every day. Uh, <laughs> I think I think Rod said that his favorite baseball song was national anthem because he knew he would get three or four hits that day. That's that's funny. Uh, and 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 lastly, uh, but not leastly, how would Jeff Idelson like to be remembered? I'd like to be remembered as. Um, the as much a fan as the game as anybody else and uh someone who tried to use the positions they had and the access they had to maybe open up uh, a little bit more of the minds and imaginations of others uh to learn more about some of the greats of the game and and and, and give them that exposure they wouldn't have otherwise had well you've been a great guest that's a great answer uh, you've given us insight into a lot of hall of famers that we otherwise wouldn't had um so thank you for that. Thank you for the work you've done with the Hall of Fame. Thank you and Gene Fruth for the work you're continuing to do with Grassroots Baseball. You've been a terrific guest, Jeff, and thank you so much for being a part of a Mick, a Mook, and a Mike. Thank you, Jeff. Well, you will be remembered. You. You'll be remembered here too, pal. Thanks, for a Pleasure meeting you. You were great, terrific. Great, great to you. see you. Great thank to you see you all. You. Thanks, Frank. So again, great. we've done it. Yeah, terrific. I mean, uh, you know, shining the light on some people like like Ricky Henderson and, uh, you know, uh, the kind of guy he was. Imagine going back to school because he thought so much of the honor of being in the Hall of Fame just to make sure that his address was, was done right. Uh, yeah, that, that that address means a lot to the Hall of Famers, I can tell yeah, you that. Yeah, well, you know, really admirable, though, to go back to school. And then again, when, when he was mentioned about Curacao, you know, I, I got to Curacao. Curacao is the ABC Islands. One of the, right. I think it's uh, – uh, it's Aruba, uh, Bimini, maybe in Curacao. A bookmaker called me up, and he was running an operation in Curacao. <laughs> it, always, it always gets back to that. It always gets guy, back to bookmaker. And the guy wanted to know if I wanted to work for him, and I said, "You know what? It's just to go to Curacao, you know." So I took my girlfriend at the time for four days just to check it out. And uh, I have a habit, you know, when I go to some place new. Back in the day, anyway, I'd run a couple of miles. I go out and jog a couple of sure. miles. So I got out of the hotel. I said, "It's a good way to see the neighborhood." And as soon as I got away from the hotel, I started seeing bars on the windows, you know, like in the South Bronx or, you know, the real bad neighbors. And I said, well, this may be a little shaky, you know, around here. 
and it was a very poor round. So it really surprised me that uh, that so many great ball players come out. Well, you, you can't walk off the island. No, you can't. The only way off it is you, you got to hit. You hit your way. <laughs> you got to hit your way off the island. He was a great guest, Frank. You did it again. Great, great. job. So I'm going to bring back something this week in history. <clears throat> okay. 163 years old last week, something happened. And you know it word by word. Let's see. Two, I got I to gotta subtract two, 163 from 220 wow. real quick to give myself a... I, I may, I, maybe the numbers may be off. Uh, 1157? <laughs> uh, 1157. It, it took place in, in a... In a Stephen Lang's got an affin- affinity with oh, that. The Civil War, huh? That's it. Took place. Had, we're talking about Gettysburg. Lincoln 18, made, 1863 was was Gettysburg Link, the battle. So. And 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 Lincoln made the speech that you can recite word from word for in uh, four score and seven years ago. Uh, huh? Well, why don't you? Why well, don't I don't you, want to bore everybody with the whole speech, but yeah, well, but it's, Lincoln it's made sixty-three speech. words. You know what? Lincoln lied during that speech. Lincoln said that the world will soon forget what I said here. But they'll never forget what men did here. And that's not true. Nobody will ever forget what Lincoln said there. And uh, the thing that really, one of the fascinating things about Gettysburg was, you know, uh, you know, there's a lot of disparity, you know, disparaging. People talk about Black Lives Matter and people protesting in the streets and everything else. The biggest riots in the history of the United States was the Irish riots, the draft riots of 1863. And the reason they couldn't be stopped was because our troops were at Gettysburg. Wow. That's why they couldn't be stopped. And the, the damage that was done in New York, hundreds of buildings were burnt. I can't tell you, countless cops not only hung, but burnt and uh, burnt alive and hacked to pieces. So a very terrible time. Yeah, the good old days. Yeah, a terrible time. I mean, uh, the, the draft riots of 1863. So were those a, the Irish? That was us. <laughs> The Irish. And you know what? <laughs> and to go from there, and go from there from 1863, and I'm not saying violence. I thought the Irish would have been a bigger riot when Prohibition was came about. Well, you know, the final indignity to the Irish in them days was the fact that they couldn't, there was $300 to buy your way out of the draft. You know, of course, they had no money. They were coming over from the potato famine in waves. And, uh, and I'm not condoning violence, but it's interesting enough that from 1863, Tammany Hall started in 1870. So uh, I'm not condoning it, but uh, it definitely gets attention. Well, something other happened, something else in history happened last week, and it was the birth of my second grandchild. That's fantastic. My, Just, my, my, little, my little daughter, Erin, had her second little daughter after the first one was Frankie, it was a girl. The second one was Blake, was a girl, which was born uh, Wednesday of last week. So. There's nothing like it, pal. I got, I got over the moon. hopefully another one on the way. Hopefully my my other daughter Megan's having a, a grandchild, her her, her child, and uh, it's nothing like it. It's the greatest thing in the world. It is, and hopefully, hopefully Derek will see a grandchild for a while. Yes. Who's <laughs> <laughs> hoping you or Derek? Yeah, Derek's hoping. <laughs> Derek. <laughs> At least a few more years. Well, congratulations, Grandpa. Well, thank you. That's the yes, greatest thing yes. in the world. Thank and, you. And you know what? This time around, you get the you get the, when they get the first time they squeeze your finger, or you know, just that. That's just the great. Yeah, thing. Well, we're over the moon, and we got another great guest next week, Grant Shad from Murphy Brown. Uh, he's a great guest, and I think Billy will like him. Derek will like him. He's got a lot of great stories from Murphy Brown. From he's done a lot of a lot of different work. He it was in Mrs. Maisel. He was in You. For three or four years, had a regular part, and so he, he's a fascinating guy as well. well so I'm looking forward to meeting Grant because uh, uh, you wrote about him in the These Lips Could Talk. You yep. Know? And if you want to read some great stories about Murphy Brown, that's the place to. And you want to, to read, read some great stories about football and the start of the AFL? You uh, and the mob. <laughs> and the mob, you can pick up. Uh, uh, Mars Gamble. Gamble, and uh, they want to pick up some. Uh, uh, a, story. Story, a story of debauchery, pick up combustible, <laughs> because it's Billy's Billy's life story is loosely weaved throughout it's, pages of that. It's, it's, page. it's stories of what it's really like behind the, behind those closed doors in the Bronx. And unlike a lot, unlike most fire stories, it's written by a real fireman who was there. It's on the level. 
on 11. Thank you so much. And we'll see you next week. On a mic, the mic, and a mic. Thanks Derek, for tuning in. Derek, Derek. our linguistic. Uh, <laughs> what, accent, what accent are we getting today, Derek? I, I like the Russian today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. the Russian. <laughs> All right, see you next week, folks. Next week. Next week's guest, actor, co-star, sitcom, Murphy Brown, Grant Shod.